Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the importance of fitting subgraphs and different structures in exponential random graph models and, and why that's a part of uh, the generation process that is important to capture. Um, so the idea here is to look at why we actually want to use these kinds of models rather than just you know, estimating links directly based on their characteristics. Um, and so what we'll do is, is uh, look at some data and compare the kinds of estimates that you get from an exponential random graph model compared to just uh, estimating bilateral link formation and then looking at uh, the links as if they were independent but depending on the characteristics of the nodes. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at uh, an exponential random graph model including covariates and then we'll also estimate a standard um, link-based model and then we'll compare the two. So we're going to use the data that we talked about earlier um, a few videos ago uh, of, about the network structure in 75 uh, Indian villages um, in Karnataka. And so again, we have a, a whole series of networks, um, favor networks, so various borrowing and lending ones, uh, who comes to your house, friends, uh, other kinds of things. Um, and what we're going to do is, is based on uh, those networks, and we'll look at, at different types of those networks. Um, we're going to build a, a, a simple um, statistical ergum, a statistical exponential random graph model. And we're going to do it based on links and based on triangles. So we'll just have two different kinds of subgraphs that we'll count. And we're going to count each um, pair of nodes, and uh, the way in which we'll make the discrete, uh, a discrete model out of this is when we look at two nodes and we look at their characteristics, we'll code them either as being close to each other or far apart. Right? So, so if we look at a node i, it's got some characteristics xi, so these are the characteristics. Right? So. Um, for each of these nodes, we know, for instance, education level, wealth level, um, uh, um, a whole series of variables about caste, profession, etc. So we've got characteristics of those. And then based on that, we can build a distance function. So we can look at the distance between um, node i and node j. And if that distance is above the median distance, we'll call the two nodes far. If the distance between two nodes is below the median, we'll call those two nodes close. Okay, so we'll just put, lump things into two different categories. Um, so we've got close links, the node's distance is less than the median. Far links, uh, the no two nodes involved have distance greater than the median. And then we've got close triangles where all the nodes are close by. And then we'll call far triangles, um, triangles such that some of the nodes have a distance um, bigger than the median. Okay, so it's a very simple model, and all we're doing is just category, categorizing links as, as between nodes that are relatively close together in social characteristics, um, and uh, far as ones that are, are bigger than the median. And then we'll build a simple um, statistical exponential random graph model based on that. So here we're just building this on based on close links, far links, close triangles, far triangles, and uh, that gives us a simple ergon. Okay, so what we can do is we can take this, fit this to the data, estimate each one of these parameters, um, so that that'll be one model. Um, and then the model we'll compare it to is going to be uh, just one that ignores the triangles and just estimates link formation directly. Okay, so standard logistic style model where what we do is just estimate what's the probability that two um, nodes are linked to, e to each other. So we'll do that based on log um, odds ratio. So this should be probability of a zero here. So probability that gij is equal to one compared to pre probability that gij is equal to zero. Look at the log odds ratio and let that be um, based on the distance between the two um, nodes and also characteristics of each of the uh, nodes. Okay, so, so we'll build a simple logistic model and then we can compare what the logistics mo logistic model does uh, to, the, to the ergon, okay? 
So we've, we fit each one of these. And in terms of fitting the um, ergum, there's software we've developed um, that you can use to do that. Uh, you can find that via my website. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just compare the best fits of the parameters. Uh, so first of all, find the best fits of the parameters. So we estimate each of these models. And then once we have each one of these models, we'll generate a series of networks from these, okay? So, so we have the models, we estimate the parameters, and then we'll generate a bunch of networks to see how well do the networks that are generated by these models match up with the actual data, okay? And in particular, what we want to do is we want to compare this to the data and see whether various statistics of the, so we'll look at statistics of the data and see whether those statistics in the data are well matched by the recreated networks from the different models. So if a model is working well, it ought to generate networks that look a lot like the data. And it ought to generate networks that look like the data, not just in terms of links and triangles, but also in terms of things like um, homophily or the degree distribution, other kinds of things, um, you know, clustering coefficients. So we want to look at the structure of the network and see whether the networks that are coming back from these models generate things that look like the data. Okay, that's the exercise. And so what do we see? We, we, when we run this, we recreate um, the, the networks. And here, what we'll do is, is we'll break things into two different kinds. Risk sharing networks, these are ones where people are borrowing and lending money, borrowing and lending kerosene and rice. And then we'll do instead friendship networks, who comes to your house um, to visit. Um, so, so when we look at this, what do we see? These are the data, the actual numbers from the data, okay, in each case. And this is what we get by fitting the sergum. This is what we get by just looking at an independent link model and not counting triangles and explicitly accounting for those. Okay? And so if we look, for instance, at average degree, what do we see? We see that the average degree in both cases is recreated fairly well. Right? And, and we should expect that because both of these models are incorporating links directly in their estimation techniques. So the fact that the, that the actual data, average degree is about 2.7, um, Sergum is about 2.5, uh, independent links is also about 2.5. So they're coming up with the right ballpark of the, the number of links, and that's true in both cases. Here it's 3.3, um, coming up with 3.4, 3.38. Um, so, so in each case, they're recreating the, the average number of links fairly well. Okay. Now, when we look at clustering, the clustering here is about 0.13. Um, the sergum comes up with about 0.11. The independent links, if we just fit links independently, we end up with 0.01. Okay. So that's not surprising. It's not accounting for triangles. And what it's saying is, is then we end up with far too few triangles, far too few completed triads. We're not seeing the transitivity that we would see in the data in the independent link model. So it's producing a network that does not have the same local patterns that the data does, whereas the circum looks a lot more like that. Okay? And that's not surprising given that the purpose of the, the, the exponential random graph model structure is to fit things like triangles, and then it recreates those fairly well. And again, down here, um, this is about 11%, here about 13%, here uh, again uh, just below 2%. So the independent links are not recreating the um, clustering well. So that's not terribly surprising given that triangles were the purpose of the exponential random graph model, so it's doing better on that. But that, let's look at some other um, characteristics of the network. So let's look, for instance, at the fraction of nodes in a giant component. In the actual data, it's about 77%. Um, then the exponential random graph model, about 74% here. Here, this is up at 87%. So it's building too large a giant component relative to the data. Um, if we look down here, uh, you know, 81%, um, 83%, uh, basically 96%. So in each case, it's, it's not recreating the component structure well either. And that's because it's not putting the, with, um, the exponential random graph models forming the triangles means it's forming links that are more tightly clustered. The independent links is forming things that look a little bit more like trees and end up uh, having too large a giant component. Okay? So it's, it's not matching on that. We can then look at other uh, characteristics of the network. The first eigenvalue of the matrix, the adjacency matrix, 
What is that measure? That measures sort of the, how rapidly when you raise the um, matrix to different powers, how fast does it grow? So it's a, it's a measure of the expansion properties of the, of the network and basically telling you sort of uh, how large average degree is in terms of expansion properties and, and how rapidly um, things move outwards. And here when you look at the data, the actual data 5.2, 5.2, well created. Um, and these are not things that would directly fit. Um, now 3.9 for the, for the independent links model. And then similarly down here, 6.5, 6.3. Um, 4.6. So we end up not matching well on the first eigenvalue. There's another measure that we can look at, which is basically, um, let's call this homophily. So this is a measure of the second eigenvalue of a matrix where what you do is you divide through by each node's degrees. So you, you actually stick, instead of looking just directly at the matrix of zeros and ones, you divide the ones through by a, a given node's degree. And when you do that, you get a measure of uh, homophily. And in particular, the second eigenvalue of that matrix turns out to be a good measure for how segregated the network is. So if that, that number is close to one, you've got a highly segregated network. If you have a, a measure close to zero, the network um, is, is well integrated. And these networks are actually highly segregated, not surprisingly, given the caste system in some of these villages, you see some pretty strong cuts. So the actual data have cuts on the order of uh, 0.94, um, 0.91, and when you look at the recreation of the exponential random graph models, the segregation pattern on this dimension looks very similar. Um, when you look at the independent links, you end up uh, with something dramatically different. Uh, you end up with something where the, it's, it's a much more integrated network than the actual data are. And again, that's because of here, in this case, um, fitting these close versus far triangles, it's picking up the fact that people form triangles uh, of, of links when they're all of similar characteristics. That's missing from the independent link data, and uh, not, it's, it's not picking up the, the right homophily. So what does this do? It shows us that actually these richer models where you allow for subgraph structures to, to be constructed and explicitly measured recreate aspects of networks beyond what they're estimating in ways that independent link models are going to miss. Mm -hmm. And so there's an important aspect of, of doing this in order to be able to generate mo uh, networks that actually look like the ones that we see in practice. Okay. Um, so we need to fit network structures beyond links in order to match up with what we observe in reality. Um, and and you know, that's capturing the fact that the links are not independent. Um, and so these statistical models offer a medium for doing that. Um, obviously, we also need to put these models in context because we need to know what do we need to, to put in. Is it triangles? Is it larger cliques? Do we want stars? What kinds of, of shapes should actually be generated? and which ones do we want to actually be looking for and, and measuring. Um, another thing is that, that this uh, still doesn't quite answer the questions of, of why some of these things are existing. So you know, um, understanding these dependencies, why is it that we're getting uh, these particular patterns in terms of triangles and so forth? We'll look at some other models that do this. We've seen a little bit in terms of things like friends of friends um, we'll look at other, you know, there's going to be explanations in terms of social enforcement. So we'll see different things throughout the course, especially when we talk about strategic formation and, and uh, look at that in, in some detail. We'll see reasons why certain kinds of structures might emerge. Um, but that's going to be an important ingredient into figuring out which uh, exponential random graph model you would want to use if you, if you want to take a model like that to data. And, uh, so that, that's going to be something that we'll talk about in more detail. Okay, so let's uh, try and get a little bit of perspective on what we've learned about the random graph model. So random graph models are very nice in terms of generating large networks with well-identified properties. And uh, we, we can mimic real networks, at least in some characteristics, by building these kinds of models. And the nice aspect of this is that they, they tie back specific properties to specific processes. So we, we can see, we've seen very clearly, you know, uh, the fact that um, when we looked at erdos renyi random graphs, they had certain component structures and certain tree-like things which gave you small diameters. So there's actually 
uh, properties of the networks that we can tie back to specific aspects of the random graph models. That's a real plus in terms of thinking about these things, understanding what's going on, and using these models for a, a, a nice perspective. Um, in terms of the weaknesses of these models, the, the big one is that they're missing the why on these things. So why are, is a particular process in, in mind? Why do we start with the lattice and rewire things? Or why should there be preferential attachment? Or, or why is it that, that people are meeting p other people through friends of friends? Um, and uh, associated with that is it's, the, it's, it's missing implications of network structure. So it's missing parts of the, the context and relevance, and I think we need to put these models into context in order to be able to figure out exactly uh, how to build them. Um, but it's also missing sort of welfare calculations and efficiency calculations, and those are things that we'll get out of the strategic formation models that we're going to look at next. So is this a, you know, which network is the right one? Um, is it, is it good to have a more a denser network? Or what are the consequences of having high homophily in the network? So understanding you know, some of these uh, as aspects of the networks and putting them in, in welfare context will be important in, in judging whether we've got a good network outcome or a bad network outcome. Um, the literature is still missing uh, you know, careful analysis of many of the stylized facts that we've been talking about, small worlds, power laws, clustering, and so forth. So, you know, a, a lot of this was, uh, as I, I went through the, in the first set of, of lectures, in telling you about clustering in social networks and average distances and so forth. There were a number of different examples that were given, but no systematic look across different applications. So one thing that's still missing is sort of a, 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 a real um, careful meta study that looks across a whole series of different structures and tries to understand when is it that we see certain kinds of properties, um, how prevalent are they, is it, is it something that we see everywhere, or is it just that certain examples that we've seen, prominent examples have certain characteristics. So, so being more systematic about this is important. And exponential random graph models are, are begin to fill that niche, but again, estimation problems are something that need to be dealt with. And um, I think that, you know, that that's something of an active area of research and we're sort of moving forward on that. Um, another thing is that the, the, the literature has been somewhat uh, ad hoc in the sense of constructing network new models to deal with uh, additional observations and having a systematic structure of modeling in which we can uh, compare different models is, is going to be important going forward. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up our discussion of, of random network models for now. We're going to go into looking at a purely strategic set of, of network formation models, and then we'll come back to, to building some hybrids between these two.